My name is Elizabeth Dorothy Buki. And that name partially explains my history and relationship with grief and mourning. I grew up not knowing my grandparents. My mom's parents died when I was four and a half. And I have a few memories of them, but they're fuzzy. And I don't remember going to their memorial service. Both of my grandparents on my dad's side died before I was born. And so I didn't know them at all. However, I end up talking about my grandmother a lot, my dad's mother. And that's because my middle name, Dorothy, is her name. And there's a specific reason that I came to have that name. When, I, when my mother was eight months pregnant with me, my dad's mom died. And they traveled from Seattle, where they lived, to Cincinnati for the funeral. And the morning of the funeral, early in the morning, my mother woke up and knew that something was going on. They weren't sure exactly, was it labor or was it some kind of premature contractions? Um, and so they weren't sure if they were going to get ready for the funeral or for the delivery of their child. So they slipped and they wrote a note to my dad's college roommate who they were staying with. And they slipped it under the door uh, where he was in the shower. And it said, think Rachel's water broke, going to hospital. And indeed, they didn't make it to the funeral that day, and I was born. And the family story goes that that timing was actually grandma's last laugh, because Grandma Dorothy was a stickler for um, propriety and etiquette and looking right. And my dad at the time was kind of a wannabe, and he had, one of, he had really big hair and a Fu Manchu mustache and like to wear bell bottoms. And so we say that the timing of my birth was grandma's last laugh because she got her son to wear a three piece suit to the birth of his first child. And so that's why I am named Dorothy. And so even though I didn't know her, I carry a little bit of her and her personality with me. And I tell that story whenever it comes up, I tell that story when I talk about myself. And that's what we do in, when we grieve and we, when we mourn, is we keep that memory of that person alive in a new way. Rituals of mourning and rituals of grief transform our relation, help us transform our relationship with our loved one into something new. This is something I learned a lot about when I worked as a hospital chaplain a few summers ago. Many of you will know this is a rite of passage for people who are in training to become ministers. And it's a true rite of passage. It's required of us, and it's transformational. And one of the ways that it transforms us is that it brings us face to face, literally, with the reality of grief and death. And this really came home for me one week. It was about a little more than halfway through the summer. I was working on the intensive care unit with a staff chaplain, and he went on vacation for a week. And in that week, eight of my patients died. And their deaths ran the gamut from a much needed release from suffering to really tragic and too soon. And that night, it was I think day six of that week, I couldn't fall asleep. And my grief and my anger at all of this death spilled over, and I couldn't stop crying, couldn't go to sleep. And eventually, I wrapped a quilt around me and got up out of the bed. I felt like I had to do something, and I didn't know what. But I drew on what I do when I need to express myself, which is creativity. And so I went to my craft drawer, and I got out some beads, and I selected a bead for each of those patients who had died that week. Um, I tried to think of, call to mind something about them that I knew, um, what they were like, what their death was like. And I strung them together on a bracelet. Eventually, by the end of the summer, I had quite a strain.
Making this bracelet was a way for me to do something with my grief. It was a way to transform what felt overwhelming and intangible into something very concrete and tangible, and that I could share with other people. I could share it with the other chaplains I was working with, and I could wear it with me. It was a way of bringing those lives and those deaths with me in an external way, in a concrete way. That's what we do with rituals of grief and mourning. We take the feelings of loss and, and grief and sorrow and anger and all of that that is internal, and we do something to make it external. And in doing so, that helps us reincorporate our memories of the person or people we have lost. Um, it helps us transform our relationship with them. To make, it, to make the loss real, and at the same time, to remind us that they are not lost to us forever. I have a colleague who every year holds an All Souls Dinner. Um, around this time of year, she and her family gather and they bring pictures of their loved ones who have died. And they share stories about them and they talk about what they would have loved and they eat foods that that person would have loved. It's reminiscent in some ways of the Mexican and Mexican-American festival that happens this time of year called Day of the Dead, when people build off altars or ofrendas to honor their loved ones who have died and to celebrate their lives and to honor the fact that they are not gone by bringing them their favorite foods, their favorite, singing them their favorite songs. Here at the CLF, we take a moment every year at this time to honor our loved ones who have died. And we do that by sharing their names, sharing their pictures, taking a moment to cry together, to hold one another, to honor the truth that they are not gone. They are with us. They are with us in the names that we carry. They are with us in the stories that we share. The dead are not under the earth. They are with us still. <laughs>